refugees from yesteryear, they failed us. They lied to us. They told us happy wife, happy life. Yeah. They the most disappointing generation that I've ever seen in my entire life. They fumbled the country. They said, happy wife, happy life. They raised their daughters into being feminists. They lost control of their households. And then they gave us all of that same residual effects and all of those uh, generational curses. And now we got to live with them and we got to fix what it is that they're dealing with. That's why you see a lot of guys saying, I don't want to be what my father was. Or my father was a drunk and that's why I don't drink anymore. Or my father wasn't there for me and that's why it is that I treat my kids so well. We trying to fix all of the stuff that they did. And then the next generation is going to be the recipient recipients of our greatness if we go about doing it the right way. But the, the last generation is the ones that failed us. They had they was the most free generation to do what they wanted to do. They had all of the opportunity. They had the jobs. They had the, the benefits. They had the unions. They had every single thing that you can possibly have to be able to level up and become great and leave us a legacy. And they fumbled the bag. OG from yesterday. Salute squad, come on in, man, and we got a damn good show for you today, and I couldn't have said it better myself, salute to the brother, you know what I mean, salute to the brother Anton Daniels for that one, because he, 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 he articulated it so very well, now guys, I'm going to show you exactly what he mean, because we were under attack in so many different angles, you know what I mean, so let's get straight on into it, recently, guys, we know that our brother, Dr. Dre, he got his Hollywood Walk of Fame star. So I want to play that. But don't forget about that. Don't forget about this. All right? When we get further, when we get deeper into the video, don't forget about this. Hundreds of fans lined up early to get a glimpse of the legendary rapper-producer, turned businessman. Congratulations, today's Dre Day. Dr. Dre on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, Tuesday morning. I'm excited. This is Dre Day. Tears of joy. You know, he's done so well for so many years and he's a pillar in the black community. This is what brought them here. Dr. Dre getting his coveted star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Please help me welcome Dr. Dre! Radio host and friend Big Boy did the intro. I'd like to thank the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce who felt that I was finally ready to walk in the footsteps of Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent, all of whom got stars before me for some reason. The artist, who is from Compton, California, and was president of Death Row Records, burst onto the scene with world-class wrecking crew and later found fame with the gangster rap group N.W.A. He transformed rap. Songs like Next Episode with Snoop Dogg were big hits. Bars from the stars, from the streets to the suites. Low riders hop once Dre beat drop. Forever in our hearts, now engraved on the Hollywood blocks. Dre's crew showed up in a big way Tuesday. Snoop, Eminem, 50 Cent, as well as family and friends. Snoop Star is right next to Dre's. Police estimated that about 500 people showed up today for Dre Day. And as we listened to Dr. Dre up at the podium, he talked about the importance of following your passion. Focus on your passion and the rest will follow. And that's exactly what, I, what it is for me. Pouring my whole soul and self into my passion for hip hop led me on the pathway to an incredible career. And I've been fortunate enough to make a living doing exactly what I love to do. And with that, a kid from the inner city streets of Compton became cemented in Hollywood lore. All right, guys, so now we're going to figure out, really, we're going to find out what's the real reason behind this man getting this Hollywood star and the reason why this man was able to get the Super Bowl last year. You know what I mean? Y'all remember? The year before last, actually. So let's 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 see. Let's get in. You guys remember this interview right here? This is gonna tie into the main event. That changed rap music and destroyed a generation. Damn. So she says, hello. <clears throat> After more than 20 years, I finally decided to tell the world what I witnessed in 1991 which I believe was one of the biggest turning points in popular music. And ultimately, 
American society. I have struggled for a long time weighing the pros and cons of making my story public as I was reluctant to implicate the, the individuals who were present that day. Mm. So I've simply decided to leave out the names and all the details that may risk my personal well-being. And Now you use your common sense, guys. We come here to critically think. You use your common sense. You know the names. You might not want to believe them, but you know them. That of those who were, like me, dragged into something they weren't ready for. <clears throat> Damn. Hold on, let me... Uh... So we're going to tell a story. We're going to tell a story. We ain't scared. You know what I'm saying? What they gonna do? They after us, not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> look, black man. So look. So he says, between late, between the late '80s and early '90s, I was what you may call a decision maker with one of the more established companies in the music industry. I came to Europe in the early '80s and quickly established myself in the business. The industry was different back then, since technology and media weren't accessible to people like that like they are today. The industry had more control over the public and had the means to influence them any way it wanted. Right. This may explain why in early 1991, I was invited to attend a closed door meeting with a small group of business, was business insiders to discuss rap music's new direction. Hmm. Rap music's new direction. Yeah. Little did I know we would be asked to participate Keep in mind, guys, when something take a new direction, they get rid of the old leader and they usher in a new little leader. You know what I mean? You know the names. To pay them one of the most unethical and destructive business practices ever seen. Crazy. So, so, so this was the meeting. The meeting was held at a private residence on the outskirts of Los Angeles. I remember about 25 to 30 people were 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 being there right most of them familiar faces speaking of those i knew we joked about the theme of the meaning as many of us did not care for rap and failed to see the purpose of being invited to a private meeting to the get to to discuss the future of hip-hop talk to them among the attendees was a small group of unfamiliar faces who stayed to themselves and made no attempt to socialize beyond their circle Based on their behavior and formal appearances, they didn't seem to be from our industry. Our casual, our casual chatter was interrupted when we were asked to sign the confidentiality agreement preventing us from publicly discussing the information presented during the meeting. Hmm. You know, that's some things that Puffy and Jay-Z and them, they be giving out nowadays. They be giving them shits out like candy. Mm, them things, them things. So they've been out since now 91. Needless to say, this intrigued, in some cases, disturbed many of us. The agreement was only a page long, but very clear on matters and consequences which stated that violating the terms would result in job termination immediately. We asked several people what this meeting was about and the reason for such secrecy, but could not find anyone who had the answers for us. A few people re refused to sign and walked out. Nobody stopped him. I was tempted to follow, but but curiosity got the best of me. That's right. A man who was part of the unfamiliar group collected all the agreements from us. So now it's going to get to the good part because the meeting about to start. Talk to him, Jake. And I bet you all them conscious rappers, all them inspirational rappers, all of them ABC rappers were part of the, the bunch that just walked on out like, no. We do not want to let the devil in. But all the younger, thirstier, more desperate rappers, they were with it. Like, I sell my soul. It says, quickly after the meeting began, hold on one second. Get your popcorn, y'all. Popcorn? Get your pistol. No, For real, um, though. <laughs> quickly after this meeting began, one of the industry colleagues who shall remain nameless like everybody else thanked us for attending. He then gave the floor to a man who only introduced himself by first name and gave no other details about his personal background. Mm. I think he was the owner of the resident, but that was never confirmed. He briefly praised all of us for the success we had achieved in our industries and congratulated us for being selected as a part, as part of this small group of decision makers. At this point, I began to feel slightly uncomfortable 
and the strangeness of this gathering. The subject quickly changed as the speaker went on to tell us that the respective companies we represented had invested in a very profitable industry, which could become even more rewarding with our active involvement. Damn. He explained that the companies we worked for had invested millions into millions into the building of privately owned prisons and that our positions of influence in the music industry would actually impact the profitability of these investments. Hmm. Then he says, I remember many of us in the group immediately looking at each other in awe and confusion. At the same time, I didn't know what a private prison was, but I wasn't the only one. Sure enough, someone asked this, someone asked what these prisons were and what any of this had to do with music. <clears throat> we were told that these prisons were built by privately owned companies who received funding from the government based on the number of inmates. Mm -hmm. The more inmates, the more the government would pay these prisons. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, the government got the good old Willie Lynch plan going on in the black communities. So he know he can get those prisons filled up because the families is fitting to split. He finna remove them dads and that discipline from them kids and that mother and them jails fitting to fill up. TV's fitting to start raising them kids. You know what I mean? Kids starting to idolize these rappers and these entertainers. And there you go, guys. That's the agenda. But we're going to get deeper, y'all. So make sure y'all hit that like button and share the content, guys. It was also made clear to us that since these prisons are privately owned, as they become publicly traded, we'd be able to buy shares. Most of us were taken back by this. Again, a couple of people asked what this had to do with us. At this point, my industry colleague who had first opened the meeting took the floor again and answered our questions. He told us that since our employees had become solid investors in this prison business, it was now in their interest to make sure that these prisons remain filled. Our job would be to help make this happen by making music which promote criminal behavior, mm. rap being the music of choice. Mm. He assured us that this would be a great situation for us because rap music was becoming an increasingly profitable market for our companies. And as employees, we also be able to buy stocks in these prisons. Immediately, silence came over the room. You could have heard a pin drop. Hmm. I remember looking around to make sure I wasn't dreaming and saw half of the people with dropped jaws. My days was interrupted when someone shouted, is this a fucking joke? At this point, things became chaotic. Right. Two of the men who were part of the unfamiliar group grabbed the man who shouted and, and attempted to remove him from the house. A few of us, myself included, tried to intervene. One of them pulled out a gun, put out a gun, and we all backed off. They separated us from the crowd, and all four of us was escorted outside. My industry colleague who opened up the meeting earlier hurried out to meet us and reminded us that we had signed an agreement and would suffer the consequences of speaking out about this publicly or even those who attended the meeting. Damn. I asked him, why was he involved with something so corrupt? And he replied, it's bigger than the music business and nothing we can do. And oh, no, 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 it's bigger than the music business and nothing we'd want to challenge without risking consequences. We all protested as, the, as they walked, as we walked back into the house. I remember word for word, the last thing he said, it's out of my hands now. Just remember you signed an agreement. He then closed the door behind him. The men rushed us to our car and actually waited until we drove off the property. Damn. So, so uh, this meeting, bro. Now that's a lot for a meeting right there. Oh yeah. Definitely. You know, and this person later on, he said, you know, this person actually ended up leaving the music industry after this happened. Well, a, a few years after this, he ended up leaving the music industry. Okay. And um, he'd say he just like, you know, over the years, he just he just felt guilty because he said as he sat back and he watched these plans come into play, come to a reality over two decades, he sat back and was like, wow, they really pulled it off. Yeah, they really pulled this off. He was like they were told not to sign any more political rappers 
any any more rappers that had messes in their no music. positivity. It was all to be gangster rap music that they promoted and 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 put out. So if you wonder where brand Nubians went, if you wonder where brand Nubians went, where Poor Righteous Teachers went, where Public Enemy went, where KRS One went, and all sorts of groups like that that was talking, yeah. for, even Queen Latifah and Moni Love and those, you know, everybody. What I'm it, any, it, yeah. it, it's a back door. Yeah, anything that was harmless, fun rap, you know, anything that had a message in it had to go. Yeah, that's you why you, if you even notice, though, now you, we talk about that all the time. Even be brief with it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, those charms that came out, like maybe 1988, 89, the African mm -hmm. charms, those, those disappeared, they lasted for about two years and they disappeared real quick, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, definitely, Quickly. definitely. Now, after reading all this, you know, it actually made me feel a few different ways. The first emotion I felt was shocked because I was definitely taken back by this, just knowing the level of evil that's involved by even even thinking of a plan like this. You know right. what I'm saying? The second emotion I felt was anger. Anger because it's not enough for them to exploit our culture and make all the money off of it. Mm -hmm. Because let's keep it real. The industry has never been favorable towards the artists. Never. never. But they're going to go beyond the artists to get the artist to influence and lure in the consumer, which they knew at the time were mainly minorities. Yep. In other words, keep promoting gangster rap so that the youngsters will be influenced by them, which in turn will incite them to want to act like them. And it's very and it's a very good chance they'll end up in their prison. Yeah. So they're getting paid twice. They're getting paid from the artists they sign in, and then they're getting paid from the from the the people that these artists influence that goes to prison trying to be like these artists. Yeah. So they, 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 they making the killing, a killing. They're using the music business to promote their private prison business. Uh, it, my man is right, right there talking that right. 1988, a man named Tom Beasley, man, that's the co-founder of the, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the 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 corrections the corrections for California the corrections for Corporation of America that's the CCA you know what I'm saying excuse my French I'm reading this thing right there real quick it's the CCA so in 1988 he founded that and this this is in uh, straight straight uh, concert with the same thing so it's like the music business you do what you do on your side and right. over here with the correction <laughs> facilities we're gonna do on this side because and now in 1970 there was 500 prisons you know what I'm saying only 500 prisons in the United States. D to this day, there's 1,700 prisons right now. Mm. That means big business. I'm talking about that. Then flip it over. You know what I'm saying? If, if flip it over is a word, yeah. because they're making a lot of money off of these things per inmate. You know what I'm saying? So getting with this, with the same thing of the of the music, it all it all went hand in hand, and we just end up we just partying at the same time. So us as the artists is the tool they use. Yeah, the music is the bait, yep. and the young consumers are the prey. It's a cold game. Cold game, bro. That's a cold game, yo. But it gets deeper, guys. So hold on to your seats and let's go. Salute to all of the good brats that came on over. We in here. We ain't here to win, y'all. Let's go. Let's get to the main event. This is my Tupac Shakur. He has all the tattoos that he actually has. He has the 50 NIG word. He has the wife. Oh, no. 
But the music industry is a secret society and the music industry's job is to do what? Promote and propagate the images that are most advantageous for the power structure to use in order to facilitate its agenda. If we want black men in jail and dead, we need black rappers to promote a constant message of destruction and degeneracy. Every rap video has elements in it. Killing black people using women smoking weed selling dope and worshiping materialism every rap video the lyrics might be different the beat might be different but the five elements of destruction are there present in every single rap video made except for the conscious you see why you can't trust the devil because the devil is just, is just as knowledgeable as god guys you know what i mean now this is the smartest and brightest shit i ever heard umar say you know what i mean we know umar could be very controversial sometimes i think he just say shit just to say shit he really don't mean it he just know it to strike a nerve in the black community but that was the smartest and the most brilliant thing he said because it's true it's all truth this music just changed my life as a whole when i'm in a bad situation and this is no joke it's like what would tupac do today we have all come together to join forces to address the issue of violence in the nation. A violent which has decimated our communities, devastated our families, and destroyed the souls of so many of our youth. Have grown more violent and depraved. I've said from the beginning that this music is drug driven, greed driven, and violence driven. Rap music. Rap music, thanks to rap songs that debase women, degrades the value of life. Here's a black woman still calling us hoes, bitches, and sluts. It's calling us niggas. And now it's also defaming our faith. We are driven by hip hop. And you got to realize that everything that we do, the culture, the atmosphere is driven by hip hop. They control it. That's the dominant favorite among African American males. Is a big favorite among young white suburban men. We don't control what's driving the black community. They do. They do. They do. Picture perfect. I paint a picture. Bomb the hoochies with precision. Ain't nothing but a gangster party. Making money off a record that is suggesting it's okay to kill cops, and that is wrong. Also coming in for heavy criticism lately, the lyrics. Now you know they use the race car, right? You know, you know I, I, us, us as fools, we looking at this as they being racist. They being racist. They telling us what's fit to destroy our community, but you know our mentality is ass backwards. We they racist. Like if they taking something from us, we should have wanted them to take this shit from us. Hindsight 2020. But again, the 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 the, the generation prior, fools in some, not all, but some, rap music. As correspondent Bill Whitaker reports, The group's name itself is controversial. Niggers with Attitude, known as NWA, has taunted law enforcement with its lyrics urging violence against police. You know, when you go back and you look at the type of music that black people had out, you know, before hip hop, look at the kind of music. It makes you really wonder why would you put out gangster rap. When you see the interviews of Jerry Heller and you know, Dr. Dre and them now talking about what happened back then. Jerry Heller's talking about how he went to Capitol Records and went to these other labels. And they basically was like, you can't put this stuff out. You know, then he went to Priority and Priority Records was, you know, accepted him and this and that. And how when NWA shot the video, you know, straight out of Compton, sent it to MTV. MTV was like, hell no, we're not playing this. And you got to remember, a lot of people don't realize that whole thing was a publicity stunt to get African-Americans to accept this gangster rap. Because contrary to what you may believe, I know it's hard to believe, you had people out there who was really against black people, who was totally against this gangster rap because they can see what it was. So they had to bring us in on it. 
Do you honestly think if NWA would have just came this music? I mean, it just bam, it's on all the radios, on the uh, TV, the video, and they talking about murder, killer, drugs, this and that. Black people would have stepped back and said, oh, you tripping. They're going to think that's all of us. They're going to think there's something wrong with us. We can't put this music out. We would have protested it, and we did protest it. This is what you don't see. WPGC. An anti-rap backlash is spreading. WPGC in Washington, D.C. dropped violent or demeaning lyrics three years ago. Last month, KACE in Los Angeles followed suit. This week, WBLS in New York City. It's in pop music, it's in rock music, it's everywhere now. It's, 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 an, it's an epidemic of, of bad news for our communities around the country. Support everything that's positive that's going on in the community. Stop the violence, right. a grassroots watchdog group in Los Angeles pressed KPWR to rein in rap as a public service. It's just crazy when you see a four, five, six-year-old child walking down the street um, echoing uh, inward, nigga, bitch, hoe, killing somebody, this or that, and they can't even say their ABCs. We did protest this music, but when you have Jerry Heller, when you have the story of NWA out there the way that it is, it changes the perception. So when you look back at it, you see that they're saying that the label said no, and then right after MTV said no, you're not gonna play your music video. How come it was on the news? How come that made headlines that MTV turned down gangster rap uh, group NWA's music video. Well, I put that out there. If they really didn't want people to know about gangster rap or hip hop, they didn't want to spread it, you most certainly don't put it on national news. You don't put it on TV so people can look at it and say, well, how come they don't want these black people to pay, play their black music on MTV? What's up with that? We remember they didn't want to play Michael Jackson. So that's something to stimulate black people and say, okay, now I don't want to play another black group. What's up? What's wrong with their music? And get us to rally behind NWA. Then you look at all of the interviews that followed it. As I said, these are the same companies that own the labels. So you gotta peep the track. See this chamber right there? It's no bullshit. This is real, this is real. Nine millimeters in your ass. You gotta carry these or you get fucked up on the street. So you gotta be this prepared. Boy said, you got to carry one of these on the street. Like, <laughs> yo, you be a fool. Walk around with that shit on the street. Well, police going to shoot you, yo. It was an elaborate scheme, yo. You've been had. You've been hooked. You've been all that. All that shit Malcolm X said, bro. Let me fess up to it. Own up to it. Don't be in deny, deny, deny mode. Own up to it and retool your mind. That's all. Dot on your target, then you blow this shit out the motherfucker. No joke. Okay, now, in your, your records, you know... Everybody grew up in the street. Killings, robbery, murder, thieving, and everything. The whole nine yards, dope dealing, everything. Everything you hear on our records is true. Man, you easy e fronting right now, y'all. Not saying that he wouldn't do it, you know what I mean? But Easy never had to do that because he was always cool. And other he he been he hang around dudes that'll do that. So he's speaking of some shit that he's seen. Easy was a cool ass dude, bro. Yeah, we figure you can't you can't rap about nothing you don't know nothing about. All these news companies down there interviewing NWA. NWA on TV saying the right thing. They saying, oh, well. Ain't it funny how aside from Easy, who they killed, they deleted. I'm sorry. Aside from Easy, look at these two fools. These two fools is, is sitting pretty. They sitting pretty. Look at, look at Cube, guys. This is young Cube right here. Sitting pretty. Hindsight 2020, guys. This is why I played that Dr. Dre Hollywood Square video. And ask y'all, what what he, what is he really getting rewarded for? What what is Doctor? What is Ice Cube really getting rewarded for nowadays? Like, cause his his movies is not really all that, and he stay jerking his own his his actors in all his movies. We really don't get to do a movie twice with Ice Cube. I mean, I don't know how Mike Epps survived. 
Mike Epps must have signed a two movie deal with him or some shit. <laughs> oh, you know, we just trying to talk about what really goes on. We're just trying to give people the truth about the black neighborhood. It's not gangster rap, it's not uh, promoting drugs, it's not promoting violence, which it was, of course, to keep it real. But it's just we trying to get our voice out, we're trying to be heard. And what happens? We get black people saying, yeah, let the niggas be heard. They trying to stop something that we doing. See, they understand us. They got us figured out. They knew what would stimulate us, what would get us to rally behind gangster rap. And that's what it was. You had a bunch of people telling us that we can't do something as black people. So you have black people listening to this music. First of all, as I just told you, it bypasses all of the defenses of your brain. So automatically when you hear this music and you get this stimulation and then the beat is bumping, it sounds good. Automatically, you're going to like it. But when you examine the content, you can't in a conscious mind say that it's good. But that's what's happening. And we're not understanding that in our conscious state. We're not seeing you know, what it is. You have to be strong and have some kind of control over your brain to really analyze this, you know, these lyrics, this content and say, hey, something is wrong with this and it shouldn't be played. And we should have said that from the jump, but they got a sucker into the whole black versus white thing as they knew that would happen. And Jerry Heller was smart and doing it like this. They even came out and said, I think it was the president or CEO of Priority Records came out and said himself, the whole thing was the publicity stunt. He said it. I think in the, uh, the documentary that Chris Rock narrated, he says it in there. He says that it's a publicity stunt to basically bring hip hop in. And that's what it was. You wasn't going to get us to accept it, but telling us we can't have something make us want it even more. And that's what it was. That's an old trick. Tell somebody they can't have something and then we automatically want it. And that's what happened. So you remember that, you know, that was like 1988 when it came out, 1989, you know, MTV finally plays NWA and we see him in your MTV raps and they put out um, Express Yourself. And that's another video, another song that's deceptive that gets you to think that, OK, well, they're just expressing themselves. What's wrong with expressing yourself? You know, First Amendment rights. Some rap artists call this an infringement on their right to free speech. Critics say the artists have a right to say whatever they want, but others also have the right not to hear it. Instead of continuously exposing our youth to negative media that distorts their images of male-female relationships, that undermines the stability of our families, communities, and nation by encouraging violence, abuse, and sexism as acceptable behaviors, and perpetuates the cycle of low self-esteem of African-American youth. For thus, images that degrade our dignity and are an insult to our children, our families, and communities concern us too. And that includes all this gangster rap and misogynist lyrics. Damn, rap music, I hate wow. that. It's just so violent. It, it destroys everybody. It, it makes kids crazy. The kids kill people. They're cop haters. They're going against society. I don't understand the music. It's too loud. It's too rowdy. It's too violent. Let's ban all rap music. Hello. Ban Tupac. Ban the outlaw immortals. Ban them. Ban them. Ban them. Black people to accept this music that's destroying us, this gangster music. You know, it's a weapon that's destroying the black community. And they was really, really brilliant at implementing their plan. And we had no clue what they was trying to do. And we just went with the flow. It's giving us music not to stimulate us, but to basically dumb us down and to basically, you know, keep our minds off of things that actually matter. Let's keep it real. Now, a lot of people enjoy, you know, gangster rap or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And personally, you know, when you upset, when you mad about something and you put on that right hip hop track, for some people, it, you know, it calms you down. But for, you know, most people, it fuels that anger. Like if you get upset and you put on like, you know, that right record, you know, you put on like Tupac Hellraiser, that joint might, it's going to make you even madder. It's going to. And that's a fact, guys. That's why being in control of your emotions at all times is important, guys. If you don't subscribe to my upstairs channel, the Brutally Honest Good Bread, sh get there, guys, because we all we talk about is emotional intelligence, guys. That's all we talk about because they'll play on your emotions. And remember, remember, 
Lucifer was in, was was responsible for the for the gospel, guys. Lucifer was responsible for the gospel. It's gonna fuel that anger. It might cause you to do something that you know you don't want to do, and you know that's the purpose of this music to fuel angry black people to add on to the violence in the black community. Can't one minute promote peace, you know, and treat women good, and then next minute promote violence and treat women like shit and talk about women you know, in a derogatory manner. So this is this is the trickery of hip hop and the industry, how they can play off, you know, things. They can deceive you and make you think an artist is okay and cool, but on the next minute, you know, you find that, you know, they contradict themselves. This was one of the issues that a lot of people had with artists like Tupac, you know. He put out a song called, you know, uh, Keep Your Head Up, talking to the women. But then he put out another song that's, you know, denigrating the women. This is the industry. This is how they play. But really, it's to trick you and to fool you into thinking that these artists are just, you know, it's just music. There's nothing to it. It's just music. And that's true. We see that to this day. Not to keep bringing the man up. So I would like him to rest in peace, but you see how they tried to kill this boy Kevin Samuels for just telling him the truth. But they, they to this day, talk about rest in peace, Tupac, and all he ever did was call them bitches and hoes on occasion. I mean, he made one song about Dear Mama, and to this day, it's rest in peace, Tupac. <laughs> Now, if you remember the video, Express Yourself, how they showed the, uh, you know, the slave master on the horse on the plantation, you know, basically harassing the slaves. And then it shows, you know, that time when cops are on police horses, harassing black people in the black community. So it was kind of kind of trying to show this whole comparison between slavery and today and how nothing has changed. And that, again, was fueling people even more to say, you know what, this hip hop is real, it's telling the truth, it's telling, it's telling our story. And they got people, you know, for the first time on a huge scale, because now you had this song on MTV. And we thought that we was actually, you know, using this music as a weapon to tell our story, not realizing that, wait a minute, the platform in which we are using, we don't own, they own. So how can we, we be trying to tell the white man about their problems or what they've done to us? And we're using their platform. We're using their tools. We're using their stuff to put out our message, not thinking that this could possibly be a trap. And a lot of people didn't realize that. A lot of people fell into the whole perception. So when you listen to N.W.A., you would listen to the music from that time. It's almost like you know, N.W.A. foreshadow, like they predicted the L.A. riots, like they predicted, you know, they were saying that, you know, this stuff happens, police brutality, and they beat people, and this and that, this is what goes on, and then Rodney King gets beat. Police want to get violent with us, we'll get violent with them, because they're ready to die. This in Normandy, right about 4 o'clock this afternoon, this started out as a report of two just left and found this. The looting and violence were widespread, and that is officers from their cars and beat them near the intersection of Florence and Normandy. At one point, two cars collided, trying to race through that. A lot of people can't fathom that maybe the um, Rodney King beating was a setup. That the whole thing was planned. A lot of people can't fathom that until you really go back and you start to examine the whole thing. When you look at the story, you know, it's weird that his name is Rodney King. You know, last name King, something that black people can relate to that last name. You know, thinking about Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's something that black people could just, you know, it is stimulate something in us to say, we, you know, what's going on? They're beating up a man and black man named King, and we tired of police. Uh, police brutality and then black people can say see we told you you know the music was, was talking about it we told y'all this is how it is you know and then a riot started you can see that it's like they knew it's like they prepared for it they knew this was going to happen they knew it was going to be some kind of riots and it's something that this news anchor uh pointed out on the news they obviously have thought about this they anticipated this they meeting the lapd they obviously have plans to deal with it and uh, as we said before, they've allocated a million dollars to overtime in case things like this happen. 
So they are obviously carrying out a pre uh, uh, thought out plan. Wow. Wow. Now that did not age very well. So I think we have our answer, right? These dudes, they sit on that high throne in, our, in the community, above the community, because they could keep a secret very well, right? Them dudes could keep their mouth shut. Those dudes can keep their mouth shut. So that's why they are being rewarded. They're not being rewarded for any real, real, real talent, any real skill. What beat Dr. Dre made that he didn't steal from the Asian kid? What beat that he didn't steal from Daz? So why is he getting rewarded? Because he could keep a secret and because he's behind every single destructive force that was selling records up until Eminem. From Snoop, 50 to M. Dre behind it. You know, hip hop is a weapon that has been deployed against us years ago. It has destroyed the black community. And it has made us think that we are something that we are not. We are not this culture. It's not our culture. It's not something you should be proud of. It's something that you should be trying to escape from. Is there any Dr. Dre beat or any Daz Dillinger beat that get that gets confused for a Dr. Dre beat a lot? So I did Ain't No Fun. I did uh slew of songs, Rat a Tat Tat. I mean, you know, a bunch of songs I probably just got programmed drum programming or something like that on there. Yeah, it was you know, it was it was a clobbering gang back then. Mike, 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 Mike. Take, 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 take. I was like, He's you know what I mean? A collaborative ether. You know what I mean? It was a collaborative thing, meaning Dre ain't make beats by itself. I heard you real nice on the pianos. I played piano for him, and he said, you're not going nowhere. <laughs> okay, now. Okay, now, let's get into the butter. Let's get into the butter. This is not hating. This is truth-telling, guys. Made the track for Jen and Juice. Uh, my homeboy Emmanuel, Dean. You know I mean, he played all the keyboards and all the melodies. And, you know what I mean? And Dr. Dre, he came up with the drums, but she gave him some credit. Some of them. What other song did you know, he what's do? What's my name? All that, wah, 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 all that shit, you know what I mean? All that keyboard shit, that's Emmanuel. But he was young. We was young, you know what I mean? And, so one thing I always uh, see about you is you always give Dr. Dre his props. Like, no matter what, I'm talking about the height, the height, the height, you know, you know. Ain't nobody better than Dr. Dre. And, and I said, you think, you think that's, that's <laughs> but man, I can, I can look in your face and can tell you mean that. Like, like I, I can on, tell. But on a producer level, what is it exactly? Don't even, mean? don't even. People be trying to be, I'd be like, hey, Doc, don't you do it. That's like, that's like, you can't put. Like, you me, battle switch. You can't you, put you battle Obi-Wan Kenobi. But there's different that. levels of why Dre is dope. No, it just, you just, it is, I'm still trying to, I just know he's just super dope. <laughs> and <certain laughs> And you know, you just know you just got to say that Dre is the man. You just got to do, 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 do. <laughs> Lying, bro. Come on, Tim. You know, you you better than Dre. Stop playing, Tim Lan. Let's make some noise for that, guy. Let's make some noise for that. I'll be like, damn, how you get that kick to sound like that? You know what I'm saying? Like... Right. If Dre don't write music, so if Dre doesn't write music and he barely produced the beats, we ask the question, what's Dr. Dre purpose in music? I started this gangster shit. Fucking thanks, I kid. You want to really have some conversations about what adult Joe thinks you've brought to this game?
how far do we want to take these hot takes? I think I could go to court and make a valid argument that you was the first plant. I'm not going to do that. Hmm. But talk about all you've brought to the game. <laughs> you brought a lot more niggas than that. But all of them ain't nice. Yeah. I don't know. Zans. Uh, no. I no? Mean, yes, Lean. Yes, a lot of Lean. That. that was the programming for Eminem right there. That, that was the programming. Don't miss the message. The gatekeeper, drug use, violence, being the engine to destroy the youth. Lord, it's tough to use a motherfucker. Instead of trying to help a nigga, you destroy your brother. Worse than the others. Have you been disappointed that there have not been more members of the African-American community, particularly leaders in the African-American community, who've been willing to be on the front lines with you about rap music? That has just, you know, that has hurt me more than all that white folks have done to me. You know, that has hurt me more because our people don't really understand uh, the effect that this is going to have on our people. Um, because we're going to be gone, those of us who've been the fighters. And I'm glad you're recording this history because all of us are going to be gone. And the kids, that's why they're recording it. All this music, that's all our kids will be hearing in 2020, 25 and 30 and 40. 2040 and 50, and they'll have to start fighting. Those who are knowledgeable now will have to start the whole civil rights movement again. Those who fail to learn the lessons of history are what? Doomed to repeat them. Man, yo, people, people be trying to help us, and we just fend away the help. Guys, I ain't going to hold y'all no longer. It was a nice little lengthy class today. Please hit the like button on your way out. Share this content, guys, and I'll see you guys later. Y'all wrap up, strap up, drink responsibly, guys.